Yeah. So uh, when we look at post refractive surgery eyes, and uh, when I say refractive surgery, it could mean anything from older generation P, uh, RKs to modern generation lenticular extractions and LASIKs. There are multiple issues that are pertinent to all patient populations, which is basically, most importantly, the planning and the selection of the right IOL power and the right IOL type. When it comes to surgical planning, modern uh, lasers are not difficult to handle when it comes to cataract surgery, but these patients also have post-operative issues. The changes in preoperative planning or the complications stand because you've changed the corneal profile from its virgin profile by changing its asphericity and the shape and its effective lens position. Uh, of the many diagnostics that are available in the market today, I think it's very important for these eyes particularly, two diagnostics to stand out. One is biometry and we time to shift for those of us who've been working with immersion and contact biometries to at least optical biometries, but for these patients at least, these newer generation OCT biometers will give better data, more calibrated and more uh, uh, usable data. The most important reason why you should shift to optical biometries or swept source in these patients particularly, or in any case of your cataract, is because they measure all the data on your visual axis, which is where it really matters. When it comes to post LASIK or surface treatment, the problem is with effective lens position because the anterior cornea is shaved off with the, with the surgery, but the posterior cornea remains bummed up, unlike a cornea which is globally thin. So the lens position itself will be varied and that's why uh, it's very important to calculate these patients with new modern IOL calculation formulas. Just to show you that this is a patient who's not been operated and if the, that's the actual anterior chamber depth of the patient. But if you use older formulas that don't understand this, you will end up measuring a pseudo anterior chamber depth because the actual ACD still remains the same. What I use for these patients is the Barrett True formula, which is thanks to Dr. Graham Barrett available to us for free on the APSCRS website. And this gives a very good estimate. So to understand whether this formula really works in our clinic, we decided to do a study where we compared the IOL prediction with eyes uh, with four formulas, uh, which, are, uh, which are available now to us. And we realized that uh, the IOL prediction errors were the least with the Barrett Truke formula and the uh, Shama's formula. Again, uh, refractive prediction was also the best with the Barrett Truke formula. So we concluded that although all formula performed well, it's the Barrett formula that gives us the highest number of Ys within the plus minus 0.5 diopters, which is where it matters because these patients have already been to clinics and a lot of patients have counseled them against early cataract surgery. So they rely on our judgment and our decision making to get them the right IOL calculation done. If you look at uh, the next most important machine, I would say is a placido topography over a shine flow because placido will pick up corneal irregularities. So this is one of those patients we want to make sure that the cornea that you're treating is regular, particularly with ATIOLs like Torex or EDOFs, because if you have an irregular cornea, you'll end up with a very poor poor stop outcome. Pupil size, I always emphasize all investigations to be under a mesopic condition. So it's best to do your topography and your biometry, which measure your dim lighting pupil in a dim lighted room so that just to show you say a patient over here uh, with a small pupil in a bright environment which is like this room here and the moment you start opening up the patient's pupil you realize a lot of aberration starts to come up and this is because more cornea is opening up and thereby more aberrations turn up so if patient's mesopic pupil is very large in a post refractive eye you may want to wear away from putting any advanced technology lenses particularly edof lenses because these patients will end up with nighttime visual problems and all phenomena. The other important problem with these eyes is dry eyes because of, again, surgery. Again, with poor or done surgery or with microcaridome LASIK and with thicker flaps, you will land up with patients with dry eyes. Dry eyes not only is a surface problem, but the bigger problem is it is unreliable biometry because it gives you wrong K readings. This is just to show you a patient a few um, when I saw the patient first time and a few days after treating with uh, topical lubricants. The aberration profile completely vanished just because it was a dry eye profile. But more importantly, the K readings changed and the biometry changed with this patient. So biometry changed by a diopter. So if you have a patient with dry eyes, don't be in a rush to operate and land up with a biometric surprise. Stabilize the tear film and the cornea and then take it up for surgery. Obviously put a tear substitution. Again, just to show you, before treatment, 21 diopters, I would have put a monofocal. But after a few days of treatment, but one diopter jump in biometry, which would be pretty embarrassing post-op. So it's good to do a... Uh, sort of a temp questionnaire for these patients as well. Just uh, running you through a few cases, 55 year old uh, who's come up with post LASIK, very late in life she got a LASIK done. And it's actually a uh, ophthalmologist. The astigmatism within the pupillary area is a regular astigmatism. 
And if you look at the aberration profile, this is the cornea, which is showing the cornea is pretty pristine, but the aberrations or the irregularities are coming from inside the eye. So we decided by calculating on the ASCRS post uh, refractive surgery calculator to implant a 21 diopter lens and the patient is very happy with the toric lens in the eye. So the first thing to understand is if your astigmatism is regular on a topography, toric IOL is a straightaway choice because modern LASIKs do not play too much with the uh, surface, I mean the shape of the cornea in that sense. The second is a 58 year old with always weak eye and notice that this is a very steep cornea and a very bad aberration profile. This was just to show you that, you know, this is a, I think this is a post LASIK ectasia just to show you that we had to put a T9, the highest power that the uh, platform I use, which is Alcon offers with an anticipated residual astigmatism of 1.5. Now I could have put a hydrophilic lens because a lot of Indian companies make them, but I decided to go ahead with the stable platform because this is anyways a compromised eye and I don't want a PCO marring the situation later. So patient's very well, very happy. And this is the aberration profile of the patient showing that the cornea is partly compensated by the internal optics of the eye and the patient is doing good. But what is the role of these newer generation EDOF lenses in refractive eyes? Uh, EDOF is basically a true EDOF lens is one that extends your focal range, not in one point of focus or three points, but as a continuous range of focus. So just like you would see from distance to intermediate to almost near without a break in your uh, vision. Unlike a diffractive lens, which has three distinct foci, an EDOF lens stretches your uh, focal point. So this is a 40 year old who underwent contour uh, had COVID and uh, landed up with a cataract five years later, uh, I mean at 40 years of age. This was a classical steroid cataract. This is post LASIK just to show you that if you do modern, particularly topo guided LASIKs, your cornea is going to be nice and clean and pristine. And this is just to show you a topography of the same. Uh, we decided to put an EDOF lens, the Vivity toric lens, the Vivity lens in this patient's eye. And this is just to show you patient was 6'9", because 6'9 is what I don't push these patients initially to 6'6". Six, six. Eventually they may read or they may not, but they don't really care about it because they see well. And they need an add of plus one. And this is just to show you a pre-op aberrometry of the same patient, which is because of the posterior subcapsular cataract and a post-op aberrometry showing you, even if you look at the refraction, it's hardly anything. It's minus 0.5 with a 0.25. Two months post-operatively, uh, this is his uh, vision, unaided vision, uh, distance is 6.9 unaided, a near is N8 and with a 1, 1.5, he's a N6. This is another patient, 55 years old, who had a microkeratome LASIK done way back when. And if you look at the cornea profile, it's not really that bad. This is the aberration profile coming of the uh, cataract. So this was a straightforward patient. Patient, now if you see, if you th this is where an aberrometry comes to a good role. If you see the topography is regular, and the aberrometry shows you that the cornea. If you look, notice on the bottom left over here, my cursor is not showing. On the bottom left is basically showing no aberrations. It's a very good cornea to go ahead and do a surgery on. But this is where the real challenge happens because now a lot of RKs will walk into our clinics, and this is a 72-year-old with a four cut RK, must have not been a very high myope. This is uh, the patient's topography on a Placido and a Shine Fluke mixed topographer. But in the center, you can make out that four cut RK causing that pattern, but in the center, it's more or less okay. We use the IOL, uh, the ASCRS uh, online post refractive surgery IOL formula calculation. And this is the patient at uh, eight, three months post bilateral vivity toric implantations. PVT is an EDOF lens again. It gives you an unaided vision of this patient of a 6.9, which you could bump to 6.6 by giving a 0.5 spherical, but these patients are, you know, most of them will not accept this and they're very happy. But a very good intermediate vision and with a very predictable plus one ad giving you a good near visual acuity on the study chart. You can make out these RK marks over here. They're very easily visible, although I don't think you can make out the VVT rings. Interestingly, all these patients perform quite well even when you do their mesopic contrast sensitivity because you would assume their dim light vision to go bad, but if the cornea is what you have to check in these eyes, if the cornea is relatively okay, their dim light vision falls within a reasonable normal range for their age matched uh, contrast sensitivity. The only caveat is you have to tell them that they need to wear light ads of plus 0.75 to 1.5 and they may lose some contrast in dim lighting conditions, but that's also partly to do with the fact that they've had a refractive surgery done. I don't offer multifocal, true multifocal or trifocal lenses to any of these patients because again, the cornea is not the best and so I don't offer it to them at all. Uh, just to conclude, it's very important that you please look out for corneal irregularity. Trifocals, as I said, I don't put because these patients may land up with glare and halos. So to conclude, in my hands, EDOF provide a very satisfactory outcome considering your pre-op workers has been very thorough. 
they do away with all the negatives of a diffractive technology and they give you a positive. The only drawback is you need to give them add of about a 0.75 or a 1.5. And with that, I think it's a great tool to use if your patient's suitable for it. Thank you. Thank you, Samresh. Very nice talk as always. Uh, any role of angle alpha or kappa measurements before this for yeah. your EDOFs or yeah, not really? I think great question, Rushad. I've, I've you know, spoiled my throat speaking of angle alpha and I've stopped looking at it now at all, I've, I've completely. Okay. I don't even look at it in my trifocals now anymore. Any questions from the audience? If not, I'll have just one. Uh, sorry. Uh, when you're doing the calculation with the ASCRS and uh, IOL master, do you take an average out of it? And uh, that is one. And how predictable are ASCRS without the pre... Sometimes patients come after 10 years yes, not they don't having have any data. the data. And yeah. how accurate is that? So, I'm, again, AS, the ASCRS calculator will give you two, three formulas. I tend towards, towards the barrett truke formula. I tell them that this is the margin and I show them that it's showing a range of 1, 1 1.5 and this is the surprise that I'm looking at. But that's the formula I like and most likely it will not come. And I have enough confidence now that I'll be within a diopter range with the Barrett True K. But I show it to the patient that this is the amount of calculation needed for your eye and it's showing four formulas or showing four numbers. So once they see it, they are mentally ready for surprise. That, that's a nice Suresh, one. Suresh, one more you. question. Uh, lenticule extraction, have you done post lenticule extraction? No, uh, they've not come with cataracts yet. I don't... I know. I, I, I'm wondering whether we need to look at formulas which are different or would it work the same way? Possibly it should, but... Uh, yeah, it, I mean, uh, the only thing is you need to land up with a post-lenticule cataract. We need to talk to our physicians for more steroid uses. So. <laughs> yeah, Samita. Yeah, Samita. yeah, so if, my, if the mesopic pupil size is large, in the sense that I look at pupil, I don't look at pupil size, I look at pupil size and aberometry, but for me, anything larger than a 6, 5 millimeter, 6 millimeter, 6 millimeter mesopic pupil, I want to tell the, it's not like I will not advise, but I will tell the patient that they will have dim light issues. So they have to be ready for it. So if they, if they are the personality that, you know, they are very uh, precision oriented and they're very fastidious, I will tell them that you may not like it. But uh, it's not an absolute contraindication for me. Yes, that's the personality, ma'am. Yeah, I think that's the personality. So the chair time will tell us. Actually, when we sit with the patient, we know. You know, either we are in a relaxed mode explaining or we are in a defensive mode. And the moment I go into a defensive mode, I don't counsel them for this because I know they're going to trouble me later. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, hi. Do you have any other protocol for PRK patients with epithelial remodeling, like really bad haze or peripheral remodeling changes? Do you have a protocol for that? No. If, I, if there's a corneal haze, it will translate to an aberometry change and a topography change. change. I will not advise them. I'll advise them. If there's anything very, if, even if the, uh, the ablation is not centered, I put a single piece lens, which is a non-aspheric lens. I don't so even put an aspheric lens. Monofocal and a non-aspheric lens. Thank you. I think in, in haze, probably, uh, you know, some of the OCT-based uh, uh, topographers and the formulas in that, they work a little bit better, better uh, because the shine plug gets affected by uh, the haze. So, yeah. so that is another thing. That That's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next, I would like to thank...